of course, from 8.30 here on 12.33 ABC Newcastle. Do you ever hear an old song and think, wow, those lyrics, well, they haven't aged well? Guess things were different back then, you might say. The latest example, as I've mentioned today, is One in a Million. It's a track by Guns N' Roses, and you don't hear it anymore. In fact, I won't play it because it's, it's in my view, offensive. It was on that massive Appetite for Destruction album. It was the album that made Guns N' Roses with Paradise City and Sweet Child of Mine. They were the big songs from that album. They're reissuing the album, but they're not putting one of the original songs on it. Now, is that an appropriate thing to do? Should there be some sort of insulation around stuff given its change of context? In other words, it was relevant, relevant at the time. It was criticised at the time, don't get me wrong. Axel Rose was... Um, quite vehemently criticised because of the lyrics of, of that song. He defended his right to, to free speech as part of that process. One in a Million, which has the N-word, the F-word uh, for gay people, it hasn't made the cut. They haven't commented on why not. We don't know whether it's a decision of the band or a decision of the management company, the record label. I've already touched on some of the songs that sound a bit off with the passage of time, but why is that? We thought we'd talk with Steve Threadgold, who's a sociologist at the University of Newcastle, and he joins us now. G'day, Steve. How are you going? Good. How are you going? Yeah, excellent. So we just want to talk in general terms today. We don't really want to get into racism or, yeah. um, you know, attacking sexuality. Um, but basically, are we able to stick each of these eras into a pigeonhole and, and say it's a it's like a museum piece um, when we're talking about popular culture? Is, is it safe to say, well, look, it was okay then and it should be okay now if we put it into context? I think the museum piece thing is a good way to think about it. I was kind of thinking about it, you know, um, popular culture often was like a time capsule in a way. Um, and when you look back at the times, you know, I, I was a Guns N' Roses fan as a 12 year old and I didn't even blink twice at those lyrics. Um, back then and because I was a different person and today when I think about those whatever different person I you know think much differently about them and it's embarrassing right I think I might have been um, a fan of that back then so but we're always embarrassed about our past in many ways you know when you when you look back at a photo of you as a 15 year old I'm sure you're a little bit embarrassed about whatever clothes you're wearing and, and things like that so yeah popular culture does definitely work as a kind of time capsule of what was happening at the time um, not necessarily what was acceptable because as you said there was criticism of what was what um, of those lyrics but you can imagine today you know those lyrics just simply would not be allowed to be released and it, it's a good example I think of a way that we can think about how um, societies move on and they progress and pop culture and looking back often show how that's happened yeah yes kind of like my father-in-law's dining setting it was there was a time when it was actually fashionable yeah and, yeah, and yeah. We sh should we just sort of so how do we treat it from a community perspective? Do we just gloss over the uncomfortable aspects of it and say, okay, well, it's... And do we pull our children aside and say, well, look, we don't say that word anymore and we don't do this and we don't do that, but back then we did? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, certainly you shouldn't, you shouldn't be concerned, um, but I think, you know, if people are going to talk about it and I think that's a good way to talk about um, issues like that and popular cultures are good, um, I suppose, mediums for people to communicate about these things with each other. So in the example you just talked about, if you were you know, a parent or a child about these issues um, and talking sort of about a particular text and how it's kind of changed today, that's a great way, I think, to kind of um, to educate and to learn about these things. Um, I, I think that pop culture often brings up things that make us feel really uneasy, right? So, you know, um, in art in particular, there's always a debate about whether the character of the artist should be considered when it comes to evaluating the art. And you can, you know, think about people like Roman Polanski and Gary Glitter and, and you know, Rolf Harris and the like sort of, you know, been discovered over, you know, over the years to be doing horrible things. And yet, um, you know, people are still a fan of their art or whatever. So, I, again, the, the pop culture here can allow us to have conversations about these things. And hopefully, um, from a sociological perspective, what we think of is that they can maybe they can move the scripts of what's acceptable and, and what's normal forward and, you know, open things up. Um, and, you know, to, to stop that kind of marginalisation and, and, you know, racist, sexist, homophobic abuse. Yeah, the, um, yeah, the discussion yeah. of whether or not we separate the art from the artist is one that we've had yesterday. Of course, Paul oh, Bevan right. was talking to Rosemary Milsom about the incident at the Sydney Writers' Festival, of course, where an American yeah. author was criticised and allegations of sexual assault were made against him. How important are, are the words and the fact that it's within an artistic context? I just want... Look, I, I've got, um, you know, five children, three 
adult sons now and I spent most of the 1990s doing things that were gay apparently even when I was being incredibly masculine I was doing gay stuff everything was gay to them and we know that that word now in the LBGTQI community is is frowned upon that sort of language so is there a difference between saying something in conversation um, and and sort of using it in community discourse as opposed to having it within an artistic context well I think like on a pragmatic everyday level, yeah, people use language very deeply in those those kind of um, situations. So I think people are more likely to use language in a kind of way we would just deem offensive in their inner circle and less likely to use it outside of that. Uh, but, but, but in terms of specific terminologies, um, again, I think popular culture has been really interesting in the way that it's reclaimed um, various offensive terms and reuses it in a kind of form of resistance. Um, so obviously rappers use the N-word um, quite, quite you know, regularly and they, they, many of them kind of, they're using that kind of formally offensive and well, still offensive word, but like discriminatory word back against the power that kind of discriminate against them. Um, Riot Girl and uh, other kind of forms of punk music and feminized punk music, feminist punk music use the word bitch to try and do that as well, to try and reinscribe that kind of gendered, you know, abusive language and try and use it as a form of power. So, again, I think you know, pop culture's been a way of kind of um, playing with language and making the meanings of words change, um, and um, sometimes successfully and sometimes not so much. Um, yeah, yeah. There's an element of this, Steve, where art is supposed to challenge us anyway, isn't it? To challenge the way that we think. And, and often you'll, you know, I've interviewed thousands of artists over the years of broadcasting and there'll be a song that'll say you know you're such a you know a this that and the next yeah. thing and you actually find out when you talk to the songwriter they were referring to themselves they they were writing in the third person rather than in the first person you know yeah, um, so interpretation here is um is really interesting there's been a lot of kind of philosophy and social theory over the years that talk about the death of the author where um you know an artist can kind of uh have artistic intent and make something with their own um you know, expression or politics in mind. But once it's released out there, people consume it in their own ways. Um, and that's kind of the metaphor of the death of also there, that it's more about how things are consumed rather than how they're produced in terms of, um, you know, the reception of them and then the meaning of them. Um, and so this is particularly the case in pop culture today, I think, um, where pop culture, you know, the, the release of uh, This Is America uh, yesterday has been a huge um, thing by uh, Childish Gambino and it's seen as a kind of powerful text about what race race relations in the US at the moment. Um, and again, his intentions there may be one thing. And then today there's like a million different think pieces about what it actually means. Uh, so the relationship between, between the artist's work and the meaning of it and the way it's received is, is a kind of conversation that constantly happens. And, you know, hopefully it means that we move forward and but often, you know, it just kind of ends up where things seem to remain the same, I suppose. Um, and pop culture, in that sense, there's a lot of really interesting work that talks about whether it can actually be politics or not. If, you know, um, a music video is there to actually kind of make us buy things, is it there for a political object or is it an ad? So, um, again, like this is kind of the debates around the study of pop culture and what it means and whether it's actually art or whether it's actually, you know, capitalism. Yeah, OK. So what about the issue then of those elements of society that are taboo, there's obviously the chance, and it would depend, of course, on the particular circumstances of, of, of the popular element within our culture and who's exposed to it as to how much influence it can have. But should we be worried at all? Do we just embrace this notion of free speech and, and you know, it's open slather? Well, uh, you know, we don't necessarily have free speech in Australia. It's implied, but it's not in the law. And free speech doesn't mean that you're able to um, you know, disavow the consequences of it. Um, and if you do offend a lot of people, therefore you're going to probably suffer the repercussions of it. Um, in terms of, the, again, the kind of uh, understandings of popular culture, there's, I suppose it depends on what your politics are. Um, you know, for years, conservatives kind of side of politics have argued that pop culture is like a threat to the moral orders of civilization. You know, remember Elvis shaking his hips was seen as offensive in the 50s. He wasn't allowed to shake from the, the hips down. And, and so people would argue that it's just, you know, from that point of view, the things have just got worse from there. I would argue that pop culture, in terms of the way that kind of that exposes more and more things that were previously to do, and maybe opening things up more, um, maybe, you know, opening things from repression and things from, like, you know, uh, the Christian dominance of to more and more and things like that. So, um, again, I think what you feel about it, text in particular, the way of kind of, it, it, it really is a reflection of your own politics, your own position in the world. I mean, I was talking to Paul the other week about the, the Vegemite sandwich, um, sort of 
too, isn't there? Because there's a guilt complex attached to this. I mean, you, when you're with the family and old stuff comes on telly that might be inappropriate <laughs> and you chuckle. Yep. And everyone looks at you, you know, yeah. and you go, hang on, am I a bad person now? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. You know? it's, it's, it feels like, yeah, there's guilt and there's, there's, uh, there's irony involved. There's all those kinds of emotions that these things bring up. Yeah, that's right. And, um, and so, yeah, uh, I think, again, the, the, in terms of the, the generational kind of stuff that goes on, like, um, <laughs> it's a kind of key way that you know parents and kids, or just different generations, relate to each other through often the uh, kind of you know taking the piss out of each other's taste, um, and that's that can be a, that can be a good thing, right? Yeah, I just love the fact that your kids come to you and, hey, Dad, have you heard of a band called Deep Purple? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you go, yeah. no, who are they? So, yeah, generation, you know, like, and again, this kind of this kind of stuff speaks to kind of cultural power and, and cultural memory as well, because. Um, I don't even remember. So I'm, I'm kind of a Gen Xer, and when um, when Kurt Cobain died, there was a lot of um, outpouring of grief. There was also a lot of stories written at the time by uh, you know kind of baby boomer generational kind of people, you know, 15, 20 years older than me. They were like, oh yeah, well this is sad, but you know, he's not really in the same kind of league of say Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and all that kind of stuff. So again, you kind of get this identity stuff going on around that you know my generation's better than your generation, and generally what that means is. People that people tend to become emotionally attached to the pop culture, particularly music, in that period from their teens to their early twenties, when you're kind of most most emotionally kind of open and kind of learning new things. That the things that you consume and come to love in that time tend to be the ones that then define you know how you interact and how you engage with the pop culture and particularly music again for the rest of your life. It tends to be that kind of rose-colored glasses feeling that you have for your youth can seems to be expressed through those times. I've just had a sad and evil thought I'm, I'm thinking of a segment called the worthy dead based on what you just said because i reckon prince tops all of those the, what do you mean just in terms of you know is is the death of kurt right. cobain should we feel as bad about that as we do about Jimi hendrix or whatever right. And, right. and a hierarchy of dead people or dead musicians or something it's um yeah. a sort of rock and roll heavenly type thing um yeah 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 um, Steve, thanks for joining us. It's um, it's an interesting discussion, but you say um, don't censor now what you didn't censor in 1987. Uh, sorry, I would say that you should. Yeah, you should. I, I, I can't see why people would want to listen to a song like that anymore. No, I think it's probably a sensible idea for them to not uh, to re not release that song. Um, I'm sure fans, some fans would be upset about it, but I think fans that are upset about a song like that might need to take a bit of a look at themselves. Okay, good on you. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks, mate. Bye. There's Steve Threadgold, sociologist at the University of Newcastle. What are your thoughts on all of that sort of stuff? Is there other things that grate on you?